Remember, listen up because this is true. In the strictest of definitions, if a vessel carries blood away from the heart, it's a what? An, it's an artery. And if it brings blood back to the heart, it's a vein. It don't make no never mind what type of blood the vessel's carrying. If it's carrying the blood back to the heart, it's a vein. If it's carrying blood away from the heart, it's an artery. Say yes. Okay, here we go. What's that? What is that? Ninja stuff, Richard Saltzman. Want to listen to some music? We'll play Slow Motion by Juvenile. Oh, I like it like that. <laughs> I know, I get it. All right. Oh, oh, hang on. Hang on. Then you're going to work in the lab. You're going to know those parts of the heart, aren't you? Aren't you? And then you're going to start looking at the arteries and veins, aren't you? Because the following week in lab, that will be next Friday, I'm going to pull out the respiratory stuff. You're going to start working on that, too. Hmm. What? We'll just learn the heart. That's it. Forget the other systems. Then we'll just sit and look at each other. I've got 95 new notifications. I had that student in my class, the nursing student. Okay, if you can tell me what I did last night when I got home, I'll give you extra credit. No. That's a given. That's like asking, did I breathe? No. 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 Huh? That's close. Yelling at my kid. Come on. Guys? Aren't you going to guess? Huh? Yeah, what was I doing, though? You have to be specific. I was working on my kid's house. What was I doing? Putting windows. No. 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 Uh, no. No. Wait, I gotta remember what I was doing. How, how far are you with the house? Uh, not far. Okay, ready? I'm going over the circulation of blood through the heart. Say yes. In that video, did I explain them both contracting at the same time? Uh, okay, here we go. So that's what we're gonna do. This is how I want it. This is how it works. Don't hate. Appreciate. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Whole thing. As venous blood from the body the upper part of the body, all the venous blood gets dumped into the right atrium through the superior vena cava. It's a big freaking vein. Veins got any um, pressure? No. no. And then all the venous blood from the lower part of the body enters the inferior vena cava. Say yes. Who's following this? Venous blood the superior vena cava? Yep. No, into the right atrium through the inferior and superior vena cava. Right? At the exact same time, the exact same time, oxygenated blood from the lungs, specifically the pulmonary veins. So this is one time that veins 
carry oxygenated blood. So the pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the left atrium. Who's with me? All right. Now watch, this is very important. Remember the second demandment of the body? What is it? No. The second demandment of the body. What are the three fundamental principles? Huh? Yeah, stuff goes from high to low. Say yes. So in this case, watch. If you're full of something, mm -hmm, you're under high pressure. So the atria are full of blood. So they're under high pressure. So what, you better get this. When the atria are full, the ventricles are empty. If you're empty of something, you're under low pressure. Who's with me? So as the atria fill up with blood, venous blood in the right atria, oxygenated blood in the left atria, the pressure is going to build. Say yes. And when that pressure builds enough, it is going to force open the tricuspid valve that separates the right atria from the right ventricle and the mitral valve that separates the left atria from the left ventricle. Who's with me? Guys? Latyra, you with me? Okay. So here we go. This is how it works. So blood... 75% of that blood, 75% of that blood moves into the atria simply by changes in pressure. You got me? Who's following this? Then, because the atria is made of muscle, the atria will physically contract together, both the right and the left. And it will push an additional 25% of that blood into both ventricles. The process of the atria contracting and pushing that additional blood into the ventricles is called? Atrial kick. How many people are following this? That's the, the atria contracting and pushing that additional blood into the ventricles. How much blood goes in t from the atria to the ventricles simply by changes in pressure? Can you live with 75% of your blood flowing? No. Yeah, people are doing it all the time. Yeah. They have a condition called atrial fibrillation, where their atria don't contract, they quiver. So, Grandma, I got a touch of the atrial fib. Right? You ever hear them say that? Well, make them say it. <laughs> but they can go to Aunt Betty's house and talk about their bowel problems and watch the weather. <coughs> Old people got to watch the weather. Did you ever notice that? I know. When, when the Weather Channel came on, my mom was like in seventh heaven. Weather, 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are you following this? So there's a question. Do you need functioning atria to live? No. No, you don't. Because how does 75% of the blood get from the atria into the ventricle? Simply by changes in pressure. Say yeah. Okay. Do you want blood backing up into the atrias ever? No. no, you don't. So the valves, the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve, prevent regurgitation of blood into the, back into the atrias. Say yes. And watch, I'm going to help you with your model. Uh -huh. See? So watch. Is that moving? Sure is. So watch, watch. 
the right and left ventricle contract at the same time. And when the right and left ventricle contract, it's going to slap shut the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. Who's with me? And watch, you have papillary muscles located in the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And those papillary muscles are connected to chordae tendinae. And when the right and left ventricle contract, the papillary muscles contract, and they tighten up those chordae so that the valve doesn't become floppy. Do you follow this? So blood should not go back into the right atria or left atria. Did I explain to you mitral valve prolapse? I didn't explain that to you. What does prolapse mean? Anna, you're taking uh, medical terminology online with an instructor who doesn't email you back. What does prolapse mean? Prolapse means inverted, right? So watch, 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 watch. This is your mitral valve right here. Can you got me? This is your, huh? Can you go to the left a little bit? Yeah. This is your mitral valve right here. You got me? So when the uh, left ventricle contracts, that valve is in a strong position. But some people, that valve is inverted. They have mitral valve prolapse. That's a weak position. Are you following this? So in this case, oh yeah, I forgot to do that. Then you go, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door. I hate me too. Okay, now watch, watch. Is that, a, is that something that, that happens because of no, uh, some people can develop uh, mitral valve prolapse. And it can, they can be born with it. Other people can develop it over time due to chronic hypertension. That can cause prolapsing of the valve. So the valve, instead of it looking like this, whoops, instead of it looking like this, it looks like this. The valve's inverted, right? And what can happen is when the left ventricle contracts and pushes blood through the uh, aorta, also goes to the some of that blood can back up into the atria. So if you eat a, I don't know, a hot pocket, yeah? You eat it, it's supposed to go this way, into the toilet. <laughs> I know I hate me too. But sometimes you throw it up. And what's the word to describe when you throw something up? regurgitation so it's mitral valve prolapse with mitral valve regurgitation say yeah and watch it we'll learn about this the mitral valve is very close uh, in proximity to the electrical conduction system of the heart so it will throw people into very fast heart rates so they will get anxious when their heart rate goes up so they have to go to mitral valve support groups hi I'm Timmy, and I have mitral valve prolapse. What are you supposed to say? Hi, Tim. Hi, Timmy. <laughs> you don't believe me, do you? You don't believe me? Hang on. Watch. I'll get this. Mitral valve support groups. There you go. There's just a support group for everything. There's actually a support group for people who've taken this class. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Tell me you followed that. All right? Now watch. Watch. We got blood in the right and left ventricle. Say yes. yes. Which ventricle contracts first, the right or the left? That's very good. So when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to send deoxygenated blood, blood that's low in oxygen and high in CO2. It's going to send it to the lungs. 
So when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to force open the pulmonic valve or pulmonary valve. And it's going to send that deoxygenated blood. What's this big vessel right here? Pulmonary what? Uh, 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 pulmonary trunk. And the pulmonary trunk then branches into the left and right what? No. Just, just keep going through the veins. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> These are the left and right pulmonary arteries. Now watch. These arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood. But remember, in the strictest of sense, an artery is a, blood, uh, a vessel that takes blood away from the heart. So this is going away from the heart. Say yes. So in the pulmonary circulation, the vessels are switched. An artery carries deoxygenated blood. A vein carries oxygenated blood. Say yes. How many people are with me? Guys? Okay. Then these vessels, as you can see, progressively get smaller. So the pulmonary arteries become pulmonary... Ooh, too quick. Pulmonary arterioles. And then finally, they terminate as pulmonary capillaries. How thick are pulmonary capillaries? And you better write this down, because I'm not. I ran out of room. Write this down. You're not going to write it down? Fine, don't. If I care. Every pulmonary capillary is associated with a one-cell membrane-thick air sac. Yep. Every pulmonary capillary is associated with a one cell membrane thick air sac called an alveoli. And that's what I had for supper last night. I had ravioli. 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 <laughs> I'm going to spell it. So watch. Now look, look, look. Here's an alveoli and here's a pulmonary capillary. You got me? How thick is an alveoli? One cell membrane thick. How thick is a pulmonary capillary? Yeah, write that down. Don't you wish that was a question? I'll give you extra credit if you write that. You guys are like fiends when it comes to And this 11 to 12% cuter, like 10 years ago, I actually gave you extra credit for that. You remembered that, but you couldn't remember like the functions of insulin. You realize that that's kind of goofy, right? Okay, watch. Now watch. What kind of blood is pumped to the lungs. The That's very good. So blood that is low in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide. Where do things always like to go? High to low. High to low. Yeah, high to low. I was looking for something to throw right there. You said low to high. <laughs> the air that we breathe, the air that we breathe, you're not going to believe this, is high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide. <laughs> You're going to obsess about that until I do it, huh? <laughs> Alveolus is a single alveoli. You better hope you have more than one alveolus. <laughs> Lena, do you have more than one alveolus? I hope so. 
I know, <laughs> right? Yeah, you'd be in trouble. So where's oxygen going to go in this picture? It's going to go into the capillary, and where's CO2 going to go? Well, into the... Oh, into the... Yep. And then you breathe out that CO2. Tell me you got that. Are you following me, guys? Now watch. All of that newly oxygenated blood, all that newly oxygenated blood is going to come back to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary vein. So observe, observe. Let's go back here a little bit. Okay? So you got that venous blood coming in, right atria, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. They even label it for you. Isn't that nice? Then a right ventricle contracts, pulmonary valve, pulmonary trunk, left and right pulmonary artery, pulmonary capillaries, gas exchange occurs, and now that newly oxygenated blood comes back to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. Say yes. Guys? Okay. Then, watch it. The right and left ventricle are going to contract at the same time. Watch. Bam. So when the right ventricle is sending that deoxygenated blood to the lungs, at the exact same time, the left ventricle is contracting, and it is sending that oxygenated blood through the aortic valve, say yes, to the aorta, say yes, and where? Right, down to the cells of the body. Boom. And then guess what? Watch it. You got a cell. Why does a cell need oxygen? For the electron transport chain to make ATP aerobically. Oxygenated blood, arterial blood, is high in oxygen. What's a byproduct of metabolism? CO2, H2O. Just that right now, but you're right. CO2 is highly concentrated in the cell and will diffuse into the blood. So oxygen diffuses into the cell, CO2 diffuses into the blood, and arterial blood becomes, whoops, not arterial blood, venous blood. And then all the veins of the body dump that venous blood into the right side of the heart. That's the circulation of blood through the heart. Say yes. How many people got that? I want that whole thing. That's why it's called circulation. It's a circle. So you could call it circulation. Go ahead. Call it that. <laughs> What'd you guys do? Did you smoke pot before you came here? <laughs> you guys are all like this. <laughs> I know. You should see these poor people in my night class that have to get up early. They're like this, like around 8 o'clock. They're like this. <laughs> That's why I record the class, because I know that you're not going to pay attention. Like, How many people got that with me? That circulation of blood through the heart. All right. Hang on, let me get this thing. Together. Did I tell you too that when oxygen is exchanged, it actually says oxygen in your cells? Okay. Uh, diffusion. High concentration in the cell, low concentration in the blood. Diffusion. And bringing all that venous blood back to the heart, the right side of the heart, and it goes to the lungs to get reoxygenated. Got me? Yeah. Here, watch. Did you ever look at this video? This is blood flow through capillaries. Capillaries are so small that these little things that look like little, I don't know, la cucarachas, <laughs> right? They're actually red blood cells moving through the capillary, one red blood cell at a time. So that right there is a red blood cell. 
That's how small red blood cells are, our small capillaries are. Tell me you got that. I can see you were very excited about that. All right, let me do this. All right, let's see. Where is it? Okay, hang on. Oh, just so you know, after you take your cardiovascular quiz, a week later you're going to take your midterm, and that's oral. Three questions. We set up times. You get 15-minute intervals. You pick three questions from the cards, answer them. I give you a grade right on the spot. And while you're answering the questions, I'm going to be um, playing with my phone, and I'll say, oh, I wasn't listening. Can you repeat that? And then you get really upset with me. <laughs> then you know what I do when you're, when you're doing it? When you say something and it's wrong, I start laughing. And I go, they think that's right. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. Joey, isn't that a little bit funny? Oh, well, yeah, because you give us a chance to know we're wrong and correct ourselves. We're yeah. talking right through it. <laughs> yeah. And then people cry, so I got tissues. <laughs> Don't cry. I don't know what to do. Okay, here we go. Write this down. It's in the video, but I told you I go over everything. What I'm going to explain to you now is the electrical conduction system through the heart. The heart is unique. The heart is unique. The heart is able to generate and sustain its own electrical activity. If you rip somebody's heart out of their chest, it would continue to beat for a while. You got me? Anybody want to volunteer? You got me? Do, does the heart need nerves from the brain and spinal cord to make it contract? No. That's because it has specialized cells that can generate, sustain, and repeat its own electrical activity. And those specialized cells make up the electrical conduction system of the heart. And I want, it's going to be on there. You got me? Watch. Write this down. Heart cells are unique. I can't even write it down. Heart cells are unique, number one. Individual heart cells are connected together by these little tunnels. Anybody know what they are? That's very good. Somebody watch the videos. They're called gap junctions. And what gap junctions do is they allow the instantaneous spread of electrolytes from one heart cell to the next. Now, this is important. This is important. Because what this does is these gap junctions is they electrically connect all the heart muscle cells together. So even though the atria are made of millions and millions of individual cells, electrically, they function as if they were one giant cell. Do you understand that? So that's what allows the atria to function as a unit. Say yes. Now, watch. Heart cells have something else that's unique. And it ties these heart cells together so that when the electrical impulse travels over the heart cells, the heart cells contract as a unit. And those things that connect individual heart cells together so they contract as a unit are called? They're called intercalated discs. I like that word, disc. Don't you like that word, intercalated? Don't it sound like, I don't know, something me maybe do on a Sunday afternoon. Hey, what are you doing? I'm intercalating. Okay. 
I'll call you later. Right. So the gap junctions electrically connect them. So without that electrical stimulation, they won't contract. So the gap junctions allow the, them to electrically function as a unit, and the intercalated discs allow them to mechanically contract as a unit. Say yes. How many people followed that? All right. So watch. What produces the electrical activity in the heart? That's very good. The movement of electrolytes inside and out of these heart cells. So these specialized cells that make up the electrical conduction system of the heart are still heart cells. There are cardiac myocytes. They're just specialized where they don't contract anymore. They just produce electrical impulses, say yes. Okay. So the normal pacemaker of the heart, the normal pacemaker of the heart, the dude that sets the pace of the heart is called the sinoatrial node. Sinoatrial node, or abbreviated SA node. Does anybody work in an hospital? Have you ever heard of sinus rhythm? You ever heard that term, sinus rhythm? When somebody is in sinus rhythm, that means the SA node is pacing the heart. That's good to be in sinus rhythm. What? You know, just so you know, at that meeting, they had food. And I was going to steal some food for you guys. <laughs> Glad I didn't. Ready? The SA note is the pacemaker of the heart. What do heart cells have? They have gap junctions and intercalated discs, don't they? So when the SA node produces an electrical impulse, it travels instantly over both the right and left atria. That electrical impulse travels instantly over both the right and left atria. Why? Because all of those atrial cells are electrically connected by gap junctions. Say, yeah. Then watch. If you had electrodes on somebody's chest and you were able to pick that up, you would see this on an EKG. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is called the P wave. So when you see an EKG, the first little blip you see is the P wave. And what that represents in this class is both atria contracting. Tell me you're with me. All right. Do you want the atria to contract before, during, or after the ventricles contract? You want them to contract before because you want the atria to be able to push that 25% of that blood into the ventricle. Say yes. So separating the atria from the ventricle is a little rubber washer. Every 20, 25 years, you have to get that replaced with a certified plumber. There is, well, this is what it's called. It's called the fibrous non-electrical conducting ring. You got me? I like to call it the Furmanacher. I'm not writing this down. You're writing this down. The fibrous and non-electrical conducting ring electrically separates the atria from the ventricles. 
The fibrous non-electrical conducting ring electrically separates the atria from the ventricles. Let me explain to you. Let me explain it. I'm going to explain it. When the SA node fires, the electrical impulse travels instantly over both the right and left atria. Say yes. If there was no furbin occur, those electrical impulses that were generated in the SA node would go directly to the ventricles, and the atria and the ventricles would contract at the same time. Do you want that to happen? No. What prevents those electrical impulses generated in the SA node from traveling directly to the ventricles? The fibrous non-electrical conducting ring. Say yes. So, watch. Who's with me so far, guys? Okay, so let's do this. You've got the impulse generated in the SA node. It travels instantly over both the right and left atria. And on an EKG, you're going to see a little blip. What's that called? The P wave. What does the P wave represent? Both atria contracting. So now, you got the furbin to occur. And that prevents that impulse that was generated in the SA node from traveling directly to the ventricles. But that impulse has to get to the ventricles. So it goes to the next portion of the electrical conduction system. And that next portion is called the atrioventricular node or AV node. Are you with me? In the, in the AV node, that impulse sits there for a split second. The reason that impulse sits there for a split second is to allow the atria to contract and push that blood into the ventricles. Who's following this? Guys? Guys? The AV node is the next portion of the electrical conduction system. and. When all the impulses that were generated by the SA node, they will get funneled into the AV node. And then those impulses sit there for a split second. How, how many people are following this? The purpose of that impulse sitting there is to allow the atria to contract to push that additional blood into the ventricles. Say yes, guys. Then that electrical impulse is going to travel through the bundle of his or in your book it's called the AV bundle in women it's called the bundle of her okay now watch then as you can see the bundle of his branches into the left bundle branch left bundle branch you got me and then it also branches into the right bundle branch who's following guys To allow the atria to contract and push that additional blood into the ventricle. Okay. okay. Then that impulse is going to travel through the bundle of his. Then it's going to split into the left and right bundle branches. And then finally, it bifurcates and fasciculates. 248 and bring in your bifurcate and fasciculate. No. It splits up into smaller electrical fibers called Purkinje fibers. Oh. You got me? 
Purkinje fibers both on the right and left ventricles. Guys, how many people are even like remotely following this? Yes or no? Right. Life is hard. Now watch. When the electrical impulse travels through the bundle of his, the left and right bundle branch, then the Purkinje fibers of the left and right bundle branch. On an EKG, you get this. This, this guy right here is called the QRS complex. And the QRS complex represents both ventricles contracting. Who's with me? Let me put this back up here. Okay, watch. So you got the P wave, then you got your little delay here, then you have the QRS complex, so, what does the P wave represent? Both atria contracting. What does this little line represent with no electrical activity? The pause in the AV node. And then, what does this represent? This represents the impulse going through the bundle of His, the right and left bundle branch, and Purkinje fibers of both the right and left ventricle at the same time. And where was that on the little? And that represents, is represented by the QRS. So QRS. Say yes. yes. Now, what produced that electrical activity one more time? Electrolytes. Electrolytes. So what you have to do, what your heart has to do, because you want to have more than one heartbeat today, right? That should be your to-do list. Read the textbook and have more than one heartbeat today. So the electrolytes in the ventricle have to reset themselves. So that will show up as a wave called the T wave. And the T wave, that represents the electrolytes in the ventricles resetting themselves. The T wave represents the electrolytes resetting themselves in the ventricles. Okay, I'm going to give you a quiz. Ready? Ready? What am I doing behind my hand? Huh? <laughs> What am I doing? Pointing. What? Pointing. No. What am I doing? Flipping us off. <laughs> no, you thought I was, but I had two <laughs> fingers. You couldn't tell, could you? You couldn't tell. So watch. The electrolytes in the atria have to reset too. How come you don't see the electrolytes in the atria resetting on the EKG? Better write this down. I think it's a question on your take home cardiovascular quiz, too. The reason you don't see the electrolytes resetting in the atria is because the ventricles, the QRS complex, is covering up, blocking the resetting of the electrolytes in the atria. Did you follow that? The QRS complex electrical activity is covering up the atrial uh, resetting of the electrolytes. That's why you don't see it. That's why I held up my hand. What am I doing now? What am I doing now? No, I was flipping you off. See, you couldn't tell. So I'm going to say this again. The QRS complex masks 
the resetting of the electrolytes in the atria. That's why you don't see the atria resetting. Yes or no? Guys? Okay. Boom. So I explained to you the electrical conduction system of the heart. Did I not? I explained to you, then I also explained to you the other question, what's happening at each point on this EKG? Didn't I? No, you are uh, alveoli and cardiac output. Yep. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go over it. How many people got this? Uh, what people always forget, and I, because I like you guys as far as you know, they always forget the little delay in the AV node. You better not forget that. Tell me, yeah. yeah. Okay. So are we going to have to draw the whole thing, or are you going to just give it to us and have to explain it? Yeah, I give you a picture. Okay. Yeah, you have to explain the electrical conduction system, though. Okay. Does that make sense? If you look at the cardiovascular quiz, there's a picture of that EKG on it. See how nice I am? Yeah. You would thought you were going to have to draw that, huh? Yeah. Then you'd have to study how to draw it. That wouldn't be good. You guys aren't into this today, are you? You guys want to go shopping, don't you? Why, oh, did you get paid today? All right. Do you want to uh, work in lab now and do the do the? Uh, do you want me to uh, go through cardiac output real quick? Yeah. No. I'm going over everything. I'm tired too. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Anybody got a rubber band? I can't use that. It won't fly good. No, these are good. me you got that Who, who's with me so if you don't stretch the heart very hard right it doesn't generate a lot of pressure I know, I know. <laughs> if you stretch the heart a lot it will generate a lot of pressure tell me you're following this okay how do you stretch your heart by adding more blood back to it. Say yes. yes. I'm going to tell you that this is Starling's Law. Starling's Law states that if you add more blood back to the heart, you will stretch it. And if you stretch a normal heart, it will contract harder. So the blood pressure goes up and the amount of blood pump per beat goes up. Say yes. <coughs> Who's with me? <coughs> Guys? Watch it. Watch it. <sighs> yes. Yes. How many people had to go pee before quiz number two? Right before quiz number two, you're like, ooh, I got to pee. Do you know why? High blood pressure goes up. Anytime you increase your blood pressure, 
it makes you pee. Watch it. Here we go. I want this whole thing. Whole thing. What do I want? Whole thing. Whole thing. <laughs> so just the rubber band thinks the cardiac output. No. I have to explain this before I can explain cardiac output. I've just explained, I just explained Starling's Law of the Heart. I actually said that. I just explained Starling's Law of the Heart. Do you remember that? I'll never forget it. It was 2.57 on a Friday. Ready? Okay. Now watch. What determines the amount of blood pumped by the right heart? Oh, I thought we went over this. I know we did. Right, we did. Wait, hang on. The amount of blood pumped by the right heart, the amount of blood pumped by the right heart is determined by the amount of venous blood that comes back to it. Say yes. What determines the amount of blood pumped by the left heart? The amount of blood pumped by the right heart. Say yes. Because the right and left side of the heart pump the same amount of blood. Who's with me? The amount of venous blood coming back to the right heart ultimately determines the amount of blood pumped by the left heart. Why are you... Say yes. You know, I'm getting a GoPro. I'm going to wear it and then show you what I'm looking at. Guys, how many people followed this? All right. So if you think of the heart like a rubber band, right? Write this down. You stretch the heart. You stretch the heart by adding more blood back to it. More venous blood back to it. You got me? Who's following this? All right. So watch. And when you stretch the heart by adding more venous blood back to the right side of the heart, what are you going to do to the right side of the heart? You're going to stretch it, right? And when you stretch the heart by adding more blood back to it, That increases the force of contraction of the heart in a normal heart. And when you increase the force of contraction of the heart, that increases systolic blood pressure and increases the amount of blood pumped, pumped, per beat, per beat. How many people are with me? Guys, now watch. Whatever you do on the right side of the heart, you're going to do on the left side of the heart. So if you add more venous blood back to the right side, what are you going to do to it? You're going to stretch it. That's going to increase the force of contraction, and that's going to lead to an in, uh, increase in systolic blood pressure and the amount of blood ejected with each beat. So what's going to happen to the amount of blood that goes to the lungs? It's going to go up. And if there's more blood going to the lungs... All of that blood that was in the lungs now comes back 
to the left side of the heart. Say yes. Say yes. And if you add more blood back to the left side, what do you do to it? You stretch it. And when you stretch it, that increases the force of contraction and leads to an increase in systolic blood pressure and the amount of blood pump per beat. Say yes. How many people got that? Yes or no? Okay, so watch. Watch. Let me get rid of this. Hang on. Okay, this is the kicker now. Now get this. Get this. Get this. One of the things that determines the amount of venous blood coming back to the right side of the heart, you, one of the things that determines the amount of venous blood coming back to the right side of the heart is blood volume. What's blood mostly made out of? Water, right? So watch. Watch. If you drink water, who's drinking water right now? Is that Piggly Wiggly water you got there? That's purified life. Okay, good. If you drink water, that water is going to get into your digestive tract and it's going to absor get absorbed into the bloodstream. Say yes. What's going to happen to your blood volume? It's going to go up. Quit it. This stuff's exciting. <laughs> if your blood volume goes up, that's going to increase venous return. Say yes. And if venous return goes up, what are you going to do to the right side of the heart? You're going to stretch it. Say yes. So what's going to happen to the force of contraction the pressure that the right ventricle is creating and the amount of blood ejected with each beat. It's going to go up. And whatever you do on the right side, you're now going to do to the left side. So what's going to happen to the amount of oxygenated blood coming back to the left side of the heart? You're going to add more blood back to it? What are you going to do to the left side of the heart? Stretch it. So what's going to happen to the force of contraction, the systolic blood pressure, and the amount of blood ejected with each beat? It's going to go up. Just remember, up. <laughs> and listen up, because this be true. Any time in a resting humanoid, you increase systolic blood pressure. That pressure goes up in these things that appear to be doorknobs. That pressure goes up in the kidneys and forces your kidneys to make more pee pee. That's why you pee if you drink a lot of water and it's purely mechanical. It's called pressure diuresis. Anything that makes your blood pressure go up in a resting person makes you pee more. Say yeah. Say yes. Okay. Question. If it's not a resting person, it's like an active person. If they're exercising and your blood pressure you'll goes sweat. up, you'll, um, sweat. you'll like, sweat. Yeah, and I'll explain why you don't pee even though your blood pressure is up for hours. Do you know why you don't pee when you're exercising? Well, I don't know. Does anybody know? You sweat it? No, you don't sweat. Maybe because your fight, your fight or flight triggers and maybe that, that releases hormones that pee in it. 
that's close. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's very close. I wouldn't give you like an A, but uh, you know, that's good. <laughs> okay, guys, watch. Watch. What happens to your blood pressure when you're scared? That's why you had a pee before the quiz. You get nervous, little epinephrine, your blood pressure goes up, and you get pressure diuresis. That's why people, if they're really scared, will pee their pants. You, have you ever been really scared where you pee your pants? I was today, talking to those nurses. Like, man, they're going to beat me up. Tell me you follow, guys. So if somebody gets their arm hacked off, what's going to happen to their blood volume? It's going to go down. So what's going to happen to venous return? So what's going to happen to the heart? It's going to be what? It's not going to be stretched as much. So what's going to happen to the force of contraction, the pressure that the right heart generates, and the amount of blood ejected with each beat? Good. So what you do on the right side, you're going to do on the left. So the left side now has less blood, less stretch, less force of contraction, a drop in blood pressure, and a drop in the amount of blood ejected with each beat. That's why as people lose blood, they lose consciousness. Because you're not getting blood flow to your brain. Tell me you got that. Where do you store extra venous blood? Is there any pressure in the veins in, uh, in your veins? No. So, can I buy your Coke? So if somebody's blood pressure is down, you lay them flat and you lift their legs up. So all of that venous blood will come back to the right side of the heart. What will it do to the right side of the heart? Stretch it. What will happen to the force of contraction, the pressure, and the amount of blood ejected with each beat? And what you do in the right side, you're going to do in the left. And that's going to stretch the left side of the heart, increase the force of contraction, increase their systolic blood. I tell me you got that. That's why when people's blood pressures are low, there's a little button on the foot of the bed. You press it, and it puts them on their head. See, now you know why they do that. See? You didn't know before, did you? That's the education of Gateway Technical College students, and it continues. Tell me, yeah? Why when you cross your legs can it increase blood pressure? Why when you cross your legs because it can it increase blood pressure? Elevate their feet, that makes sense. Like, like stand up on their toes, I mean. Um, okay. Now you had to ask. Now you got to live with the answer. <laughs> Watch. When you contract a muscle, when you contract a muscle, you squish the artery. So what happens to resistance to arterial blood flow? It goes up. So what has to happen to your systolic blood pressure to maintain blood flow? That's why. That's why I always say, make sure the person is sitting, they're relaxed, their arm is at the level of their heart. That's why they tell you to do that. That's why, watch, a good doctor, a good doctor, when you go and see the doctor and they take your blood pressure, it may be high. You sat there for a while, right? You watched Cheaters on the WB, <laughs> right? So when you go in there, doctors are paid to find stuff wrong with you. Do you understand that? So you're going to get nervous when you go in there. And when you get nervous, what's released? Urine. <laughs> right there, you just start piddling, huh? Epinephrine's released, and what does epinephrine do to your blood pressure? That's what, what's called white coat syndrome. You see the white coat, 
You get scared, your blood pressure goes up. That's why a good doctor will say, look, your blood pressure is a little high. I'm not going to treat you. Go and have it checked at Walgreens or whatever. Do that for like three or four times and see what number you get. And then call me and let me know what the number is. And if it's still elevated then, then they'll treat it. But they won't treat it with one high blood pressure reading. They need at least three blood pressure readings. Tell me you got that. Did you follow that? Yes or no? That's why if someone is dehydrated, their blood pressure is low, and they will get dizzy and lightheaded. Say yes. Okay, watch. How do you get venous blood back to the right side of your heart? walking contracting muscles right so if you stand at attention and you're not contracting your muscles you lock your knees by gravity where does all that venous blood go so now less blood coming back to the right heart less stretch less pressure less blood ejected to the lungs less blood in the left side of the heart less stretch less pressure less blood flow to the brain and you pass out. And what do you do when somebody passes out? Did you follow that? All right, I have to do cardiac output. <laughs> watch, 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 watch. If I say I'm going to do cardiac output, then I'm going to do it. I told you I'd have to do this before I could explain cardiac output. Am I right? Come on, here we go. What? Yeah, if I'm not, you guys are up a crick. Yeah. Okay, I'm going over cardiac output now. The real cardiac help, <laughs> not those phony ones. <laughs> you guys aren't used to this at all, are you? Are you? Is it that bad? Is it? It's good. Right, you're learning something, right? See, there you have it. You might learn some more. Who knows? Okay, I'm going over cardiac output. No more talking. writing it out too. What's the number? Ten. Ten. I'll write the number down too. Okay. It's Raina, right? Did I say that right? Okay. No one else can answer this question except Raina. How much blood does the average adult pump each minute? That's very good. So cardiac output for that whole minute is 5,000 cc's per minute. Do we pump all 5,000 cc's at once? Yeah, well, yeah, kind of right. Do we? Yeah, because both parts are pumping at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's on tape too. If we pumped all 5,000 cc's at once, we would need a ventricle like this big, right? And then what would happen, it would contract, and you'd be like, and then right before the next year, you'd be like, do you follow that? Plus, it would be sticking out here, five liters, right? You'd have to have like a little, like a little. No, you'd have to have like a little stand with a wheel on it. And you'd have to walk around like this. Then you could put some rims on that. Like 28s. Then you could put <laughs> you could put some bass on the back and you could be beaten hard. Get it? Beaten hard? Okay, got it. Not all at the same time. Moving on. 
See, it's a heart and it beats. <laughs> Ten years ago, this dude goes, Tim, you're a hot mess. So I go, is that a good thing? And she's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay. All right, so here we go. We don't pump it all at once. I've made my, myself really clear on that one, right? We pump a little bit over that entire minute. Now, how do you know your left ventricle is contracting? Mine's not contracting. <laughs> your, when your left ventricle contracts, that's your pulse. You got me? If you're an aid, you take pulses all the time. Say, yeah, that's a number of times your left ventricle contracts. So that's called your heart rate. Say yes. And every time the left ventricle contracts, it squeezes out, pushes out a certain amount of blood with each beat. Write this down. I'm not. The amount of blood ejected with each beat of the heart is called your stroke volume. The amount of blood ejected with each beat of the left ventricle is called your stroke volume. Are you with me? How much blood do we pump each minute at rest, an average adult? 5,000 cc's per minute. And that is equal to your heart rate, HR, times your stroke volume, SV. Who's with me? Guys? What's your normal heart rate at rest? 60 to 100. So we'll average that out. That comes out to 70 beats per minute. How much blood is ejected with each beat of the heart? That's math. Who wants to do the math? I'm not even saying it again. So the 70 is the average of the... The 70 is the number of times the left ventricle contracts. And each time it contracts, it squishes out a certain amount of blood. That's the stroke volume, right? So I'll do the math for you. How much? 74? 71. Yeah. So we're going to just say 70 to keep the math simple. 70 cc's per beat. You got me? And using the factor cancellation method you learned in chemistry, the beats cancel out, and you're left with 4,900 cc's per minute or approximately 5,000 cc's per minute. Do you follow this? Guys, that, Reina, is cardiac output. Now, watch. True or false, the heart, the left ventricle, has to pump more blood when you're exercising. Does it have to pump more blood? Say yes. What do you mean why? You're demanding more. What do you mean where you get extra blood? Do you do you circulate all of your venous blood all the time? You don't, right? Do you have extra blood that's stored in your veins? You better. Right? You cut yourself shaving and a little blood drips out, you pass out. I'm lost blood. I need all of that. Do you have extra blood? Yes. yes, you do. Where do you store it? In your legs. So in times of higher demand, you've got to send more oxygenated blood to muscle cells because you're exercising. Where do you get that extra blood? From the veins of your legs. Watch. 
So you start running, and when you run, you contract more muscle. And when you contract more muscle, you squish the veins more. And when you squish the veins more, more blood goes back to the right side of the heart. Yes. <laughs> do you follow that? And when you add more blood back to the right side of the heart, what are you going to do to it? Stretch it. So what's going to happen to the force of contraction, the systolic blood pressure, and the amount of blood ejected with each beat? And we learned that what's, it, what's the term to define the amount of blood ejected with each beat? Yeah, just look. <laughs> what's it called? Stroke volume. So when you exercise, does your stroke volume go up? Yes. Is exercise stressful? Yeah, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? How many people have you heard of? that have had a massive heart attack, sitting on a recliner, doing nothing. Not many. You know when you see them having a massive heart attack? Shoveling heavy snow, right? Play a basketball. <laughs> Tell me you got that. Exercise is bad for you. You exercise, you could die. Why are you laughing? What's the goal of the body, Mariah? No, that's the goal of cardiovascular system. When you exercise, you throw everything out of homeostasis. Your blood pressure goes up, your breathing goes up, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Tell me why that's good for you. Don't eat. <laughs> Boom. That's what you do. Your body, uh-uh. If anyone can tell me why lacing up their little uh, Nikes and going out and running is good for you, I'll give you an A. You never have to come to class... What'd you say? It's uh, d uh, there is no answer because I'm right. So, so for this cardiac output. No, we covered cardiac output. <laughs> Go back. Go back. Do we gotta do that math part of it, or can we just do the words part of it? <laughs> Are we gonna have to write up that little? Yes. The math. You you're kidding me. Yeah, and that's why the nursing program, they should get rid of math and <laughs> chemistry. Do you follow, did you follow this? They should get rid of speech. Wait. <laughs> If they're looking to cut credits, the last thing they should ever cut from the curriculum for people at a, a community college is science classes. Why would they keep speech and not have terminology? You know what? Look, hang on. I'm going to tell you, hang on. She. <laughs> She's like a little puppy on a bone, you know what I mean? She just will not let that go. Right? Cardiac output, alveoli, and arterial blood needing to know where it goes. Did I do cardiac output? Explain what? The recording. I did. Okay, I'm going to explain this one, and then I don't care what you do. Okay. <laughs> Ready? I didn't, I didn't plan on doing all this today. I plan on doing this for like a little bit. Right. You speak for everyone sitting in this class, just so you know. Okay. Watch. Watch. Since the arm's up, I'll do the arm, okay? If this dude, maybe I can do this. Started lifting a dumbbell.
<laughs> what was that supposed? What are you saying it was? That dude would be jacked up then. <laughs> you know, you, you know, you guys' minds are in the gutter, man. Yeah, they're sweet. Yeah. Okay, now watch. You, the guy's lifting a dumbbell, okay. right? Here, well, he's a manly man. We'll make it 50 pounds. You got me? So watch. In order to lift that, he has to contract muscle. What does that muscle need in oh, order to contract? Okay, that's a bad one. What's the only energy that a cell can use? Good. And when you use ATP inside that muscle cell, please get this. To contract the muscle, it's broken off. You break off that third phosphate. Yeah, good. And what's the most powerful stimulator of metabolic enzymes inside these muscle cells now? ADP. The buildup of ADP. So as ADP starts building up, that muscle cells, those muscle cells are going to use glucose or fat, the fuel that's most readily available, break the chemical bonds to release the electrons and pop on that third phosphate. Do you follow that? And you are going to be building up carbon dioxide, Heat, water, forget water, and ADP. And you're also going to be building up hydrogen ions. Say yes. And all of those byproducts of metabolism take arteries that were like this and will dilate them. The byproducts of metabolism are massive arterial vasodilators. So if you're the little left ventricle, which would you rather pump blood through, artery A or artery 2? Say, say 2. Here, watch. OK. Joey, here's you. Okay. Which hole would you rather want to crawl through? A or two? Two. Two, because a wider diameter artery has less resistance. And arterial blood always takes the path of least resistance. So when the little left ventricle contracts, where's the vast majority of that arterial blood going to go? It's going to go through arteries that are dilated. What dilated those arteries? Byproducts. The byproducts of metabolism. Yay! Do you see how beautiful that is? And watch. You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. Watch. The more by byproducts of metabolism you produce, the larger the artery gets. And that means more oxygenated blood is going to go there. So if you're more metabolically active, the arteries get more dilated, so more oxygenated blood goes there. Do you follow that? Why do those waste products cause it to dilate? It interferes with the contractile process between calcium and calmodulin in smooth muscle cells. You don't even want to know. All you got to do, all you got to do is know that those things cause arteries to dilate. Say yes. Hi, people. That's why, that's why when, when you just do exercise, like, that your muscles just get bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the pump, too. Like Arnold. <laughs> okay, wait. I'm going to show you one more thing, and then you can ambulate. Okay. Don't, don't hey. Ambulate. Hey, would you buy a T-shirt like that? Sure, don't hey. Don't hey, ambulate for, like, 40 bucks. Real cheap T-shirt, too. <laughs> Yeah, I sell them at the bookstore. Okay. Ready? Are you ready? What? How many people work in a nursing home? They kicked you out, huh? Okay. Watch. Why do you have to turn patients every two hours? You get bed sores, okay? 
I'm going to explain to you why that happens. Ready? Watch. Is my hand alive? Yes. Yeah, watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm slipping off the gut, you see. Huh? Okay, so when a person lays on their back, the bones will compress the arteries in their skin. And when you compress the arteries in their skin, you're cutting off blood flow. Tell me you got that. So watch, watch. My hand's alive, right? Okay. Is it still alive? Yes. Yeah, let it look. <laughs> so watch. When a person is laying on their fatty acid, the arteries to that area of the skin are being compressed. Do you follow that? So are they giving any arterial blood flow? No. But is there the skin still alive? So it's producing CO2, heat, hydrogen ions, and building up ADP. Say yes. What do those do to all of the arteries that supply that skin? It causes them to dilate. So watch. Watch, watch. When you roll the person over, the arteries dilate and the skin gets red. So the areas on the person's back that lack blood flow when you turn them over are the red parts. And the longer it stays red, the longer it lacks blood flow. What did they tell you in, in CNA school to do? What did they tell you to do to the red spots? Just look at them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get a nurse and you keep them staying on that spot. Right, but they also told you to gently oh, rub them. How does it restore blood flow by rubbing? It produces heat. It warms that area and increases blood flow. Did you follow that? Mm -hmm. And watch, listen up because this is true. If it stays red permanent like, that skin's going to die. Well, it's already too late if you start seeing the heat. Uh, oh, yeah. It starts within and works its way out. How long does, can skin live without uh, blood flow? It can live about four hours. That's why they have you turn them every two, because while you're updating your Facebook status, like, oh, I forgot to turn Edgar in room 12. 